We've not had the pleasure of hearing um, Christina play the violin before we heard her when she auditioned for the job and uh, made us all very happy to be able to know that she was going to honor us with this uh, talent of hers. The song I'm singing is for in honor of Memorial Day, but it's not a happy, joyful, or a song about power. It's a song about the grief of one family who lost a loved one. And um, the minister of their church, the ministers, the Gillettes, um, Carolyn writes uh, music, and she writes it to old hymns. She writes new words. And so this is one of her songs which she dedicated to their good friends and members of their congregation who lost uh, a child in battle. first time I've ever sung with a violin. <laughs> Those of you who are singers, um, doing um, solos is quite a different thing for most of us, and it's so wonderful to have uh, a violin accompaniment. I, I don't know about you, but a violin is my favorite kind of music, and so I'm so glad uh, that Christina was willing to do this. The gospel lesson for today is from St. John's Gospel, starting at the end of uh, chapter 15 and then carrying on in chapter 16. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you, Jesus said, from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here ends the lesson. As I read over this lesson, I was uh, thinking about the word advocate and how important that word is uh, in our lives. And I was wondering uh, for you to ponder this morning with me this question of advocates and people who you could call an advocate, someone who pushes your cause, someone who cares about you directly, someone who knows you and understands you and tries to help you in particular circumstances. That's what an advocate is. And there are times when uh, we really need an advocate. There are times when we want to look to someone to lead us in a way because we're not sure where we're going or what we need to do. I hope you've had advocates in your life. It's not necessarily loved ones either. It's someone who comes at a particular time with a particular set of skills and leads us through a difficult period in your life and mine. Well, I have one example, one very important example in my own life I want to share with you. Uh, there was a man named Woodhouse. He was a young doctor. He was an orthopedics doctor and freshly graduated. And as I recall him, um, this was a very long time ago, about 60, 55 or 60 years ago. He was tall and handsome and smart and well-dressed, and he was the picture of a doctor uh, on a if you're going to put a doctor's cup picture on a, med a medical uh, brochure, he would be one that you would use. My mom and dad brought my seven-year-old sister to this Dr. Woodhouse. He was recommended to them. He was a specialist. And Sally was hurting very badly. Uh, she had a deterioration in her one hip, and so she was limping all the time. She was in pain. She had trouble sleeping. And uh, now we had to do something about this. My mom and dad were dealing for the first time with serious illness, and so this was all very new to them. And um, you know, it's amazing what we deal with nowadays, the ongoing processes that keep us going. Um, generations before, you know, quite often, uh, people got hip injuries or leg injuries or something else, and they just stayed home. It must have been that way, because look at the way the churches are built. There's no way to roll anybody in here. There's no easy way to come up a bunch of stairs or go on different levels. And so our ancestors way back, when they got to be hurting and not able to walk, I guess they didn't go to church. Kind of funny to think of it that way, isn't it? Before elevators. No ramps, just stairs. Well, this was a first time experience for my mother and father. And my mom and dad had no money. Believe me, they had no money. And so whatever this was going to cost, they were going to have to borrow. And so, of course, they were worried about that. They worried about money all the time. And so they saw this Dr. Woodhouse, and he examined Sally, and they did the x-rays and the other things they did in those days. And he recommended a very new way of treating Sally's problem. It wasn't the ordinary way. It was a new way. The ordinary way was to put her on crutches and tie the leg up, or put her to bed for two years and have a tutor. He recommended this brace, which was his idea, and it was new. He was not only a doctor, however. He was a faithful advocate. He was the compassionate healer. 
And when my mother and father talked with him and he explained things and he touched Sally's face while he talked and they laughed and smiled, my mother and father felt somehow they had been guided to this special doctor, to this doctor they could have confidence in. Mom would tell me years later about how good she felt watching this doctor talk with my little sister. Sometimes he talked to Sally as though nobody else was in the room, she said. Your father and I could have been out for coffee or something because these two had a life going on by themselves, a conversation, some laughter. He would talk to her about her schoolwork. And Sally will tell you if you ever meet her and I can get her to fess up, she was, without a doubt, the most outstanding elementary school seven-year-old that ever lived. She really believes that. Uh, she's got a letter from one of her teachers who told her that, and I said to her, nobody cares about that letter, Sally. But at any rate, but she was a lively kid, and the two of them had this wonderful relationship. They became truly a team. Dr. Woodhouse and my sister became a team. And for two and a half years, they fought this battle together. They talked about it. He would call up when something new had taken place. And when she had been refitted for the brace because the brace had to change as she grew, he would call up and say, how is it going? Knowing very well that every time that brace changed, she was in pain. And she had sores on her legs. But her leg was coming along and she was actually running with this big, heavy brace. Have you seen the movie Forrest Gump? Well, she had a brace like that on one leg and a big, heavy shoe built up four inches on the other. They became a team, and Sally was healed. And so when I think of an advocate, I think of him. And some of that rubbed off on all of us. I, I will tell you that my family has been extremely lucky in getting physicians, medical people, that deal with us in various ways. And I know this is not true for everyone, and obviously there are medical people, doctors and nurses and others, who kind of stink. <laughs> but then there are the wonderful ones. And I've been lucky to have those. And so in the times when I've had to have medical care, I've been lucky to find people I have really great confidence in. And they've put me at peace. Jesus said, this advocate is coming to you, to every one of you. I'm leaving now, but I'm sending this advocate, and this is the great gift. Although the disciples must not have received it as a gift, Jesus saying, I'm leaving you now. I'm going. Because I'm sure they felt, well, how could life possibly go on when we don't have Jesus near us? Just at times, for instance, you feel somehow you are separated from God. Your problem or your issues or whatever's going on in your life somehow has separated you from God. But Jesus says, there is the advocate. There is the advocate here. And so Jesus, who was the picture of whole humanity, Jesus, who was the one, the most human one, the one who taught us what a human being ought to be, sends us the advocate to guide us into all truth, he said. To guide us into all truth. It wasn't as though Jesus could give us all the truth at one time. He didn't believe that. He didn't tell his disciples that. But the advocate needed to guide us because new things happen. New possibilities are always uh, arriving. And you and I have looked at a world that has changed so drastically. But the advocate is here to guide us into all truth. You can't see the whole truth, can you? There's so much for us to know nowadays. There's so much for us to discern and make the right decision about. There are so many complications in this world. And so we need an advocate who is in us. The truth is this advocate is in us, you and me. The advocate pleads for you and me in so many ways, presses our case, supports us, and teaches us. But you have to have an open heart. You have to open your heart and believe that God would do this for you. And I 
in my ministry, I have to say, this seems to be the big hang up here, the big problem with understanding the Holy Spirit. People say, well, tell me about the Holy Spirit. And I don't know the whole picture here. I understand what scripture tells us and people can read that and we can talk about it and I can preach about it. But the fact of the matter is, do you believe that God would do this for you? That God would send this advocate into your life that would always be with you. And my experience is many times people feel so unworthy about their life or so limited about love and persistent love especially and forgiving love very, very especially that they're not sure that God would do this for them. That we can't believe that God would send this advocate for us and this advocate would be with us no matter what. I guess we don't believe it because we have a, such a hard time loving ourselves. We have such a hard time feeling forgiveness for ourselves, giving forgiveness to others. We have such a hard time with that. And so it's difficult for us to understand that that has nothing to do with how God acts as our advocate how God acts in our favor. Because of the fact that we have limits doesn't limit God. Yes, we have a lot of limits. Each one of us in this room has a lot of limits. But God has no limits. I've often thought the reason we call this the Holy Spirit is because holy means no limits. No limits at all. James Forbes uh, is a great preacher, one time pastor at Riverside Church in New York City. I read this quote from him. There is an experience which indicates that the believer has so opened himself or herself to the control of the spirit that there is within the believer to a degree not characteristic of nominal Christians, a spiritual presence which brings peace, joy, love, and power it is my conviction, and I think St. Paul urges us on in this direction, that every believer ought to have such an experience that he or she can come to a fundamental conviction that God is really at work in one's life, sustaining, lifting, transforming, and empowering. Do you have that experience? Can you point to those times when you know this is true, when we believe deeply that God is at work in our lives and then everything changes? Everything changes. It was just like that experience that first time, and I can picture this so clearly in my mind, when Dr. Woodhouse walked into that office and looked at us, this family. My sister was about, the youngest sister was about three years old then looked at all of us, and when we looked at him, it was like the confidence just filled the room. It was a special experience that night, which I believe was brought to us by God. And think about the disciples, the ordinary people that they were, in some places a little dense, to tell you the truth. And there were many more disciples than the 12 that we always talk about, because there were all sorts of people surrounding Jesus, all ordinary people. And yet they were 10 times the human beings after they met Jesus than they had been before, because the Holy Spirit came upon them. And those ordinary people changed the world. These ordinary men and women made an impact in the world that has no equal. They discovered their spiritual gifts. They discovered the ways that they could minister for God. And you have these gifts too. You are promised at least one very powerful spiritual gift. Some have more than one. And those are the gifts that change you and change the world. And the church has been promised these gifts. And quite frankly, every time a church closes and I look around at that church, I think those people didn't believe in their gifts. They didn't believe they had the gifts. And they weren't exercising those gifts. So something was gone, had gone wrong between their understanding that the Holy Spirit had come into their lives and what they were called to do and then what they did. Somehow it broke down. Well, on Pentecost, this was the birthday of the church. 
and all the stories and all the promises of God come to sort of a point, to a head at Pentecost. Now the advocate is here. Amen.